All right, everybody, welcome to um, our annual NOAA HABS forecast. So we're broadcasting live from South Bass Island um, in the Aquatic Visitor Center. Um, this is a DNR historic state fish hatchery um, that the DNR um, leases to Ohio Sea Grant and OSU Stone Laboratory to run as a visitor center. Uh, we didn't make the journey over to Gibraltar Island Stone Laboratory because the water levels are a tad high here in Lake Erie. And so getting on and off those vessels when we get over to the other side is uh, not easy. So we thought for safety concerns that we're, we're hosting this event in the Aquatic Visitor Center, again, the DNR Historic State Fish Hatchery. So uh, Dr. Rick Stump, who uh, is going to give you the forecast later today on our webinar, um, reminded me that this is the ninth occurrence of this event. I think we talked over dinner. He's doing the math on his finger, every, everybody. Um, so I think it's, the, it's either the eighth, okay, the eighth, not the ninth. I apologize for that. Um, so basically this webinar is going to run from now 11 o'clock till 1 and what we're going to start off here is just some general introductions for folks in the audience. We have a lot of elected officials and some state agency representatives here in the room. So I'm going to call them out individually and we have a microphone that we're going to bring around just for you to have some remarks for those in the room but also on the webinar. And then without further ado we're going to introduce Laura Johnson that's going to give us the loading information and that will be followed by Dr. Rick Stump, who is also uh, then going to give you the, the forecast number for this, for this year. Um, just a mic check so folks in the back of the room, can you hear me? Thumbs up. Good. Nodding heads. Chill. Audio. We're good. Okay. Um, so first, I'm just going to kind of walk through uh, a lot of the elected officials that are, are with us today. Um, we've seen a, a tremendous amount of support come from the state to do the work that a lot of the academics and agencies do here on Lake Erie to address this issue. And so we, we have a lot of folks that are in attendance, both from the federal and state level. So um, first we have um, Ann Longsworth Orr that's representing Senator Brown's office. Thank you. Thanks so much for the invitation to be here. Um, look forward to what we hear. Uh, protecting Lake Erie is one of Senator Brown's highest priorities and will continue to be so. He works with the Farm Bill to protect and expand some conservation programs and of course supports GLRI and other other research. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Ann and, and Senator Brown's office. And right behind Ann is Jane Ruvalo representing Marcy Captor's office. Hi. You're actually going to hear from Marcy herself, I think, in a few minutes. So thank you for inviting us, and we're glad to be here today. Yes, correct. So uh, Congresswoman Captor sent us a video, so we'll play that after we do these, these brief introductions. And then from Senator Portman's office, we have two individuals, so Kayla Schriffer, sorry, Schriffler and Kevin Hogath. So Kayla, Kevin. I want to say thanks for the briefing. Uh, Kayla covers Northwest Ohio. I'm based in Columbus and help cover the whole state. <clears throat> Senator Portman uh, works closely with Senator Brown and the rest of the delegation uh, to help support Lake Erie. The one thing I wanted to mention is that he is the author of the uh, Habarka Reauthorization Act, which funds a lot of the research that goes into um, the satellites and the buoys and every, a lot of the data collection. It passed in December, was signed into January. Uh, he was the lead with Senator Nelson down in Florida, and then Senators uh, Peter and Brown were both co-sponsors who have uh, folks here today representing their offices. So that's $20.5 million per year through 2023, uh, and we're in the process of fighting for full funding for that, for that uh, research funding. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Kevin. Um, we also have Representative um, Mike Sheehy's in the audience, too, so we're with Representative Sheehy. There we go. Thank you. Uh, I represent a district up in northwestern Ohio, uh, Springfield Township and Jerusalem Township bookends with three cities, Maumee in the city and my home. Uh, no other district in the state has, had, uh, had, has been more adversely affected by the al algal blooms in the western basin of Lake Erie than, uh, than my, the District 46. I'm committed to do, doing something about that. Uh, it's a long, difficult process, much longer than I anticipated, just like this speech. So thank you for being here today. <laughs> thank you, Representative Sheehy. Um, also, we have from um, Lieutenant Governor John Husted's office, our, our Northwest Liaison, Luann Cook, is in the audience, too. Again, I just uh, ditto. It's really good to be here today, and uh, our administration is, is very front and center with, um, you know, the um, how vital this lake is to everyone in the waters of the state of Ohio. So we're pending some money coming out of the budget, so we'll see where that goes. Right, Jim? <laughs> and to Luann's left, Representative Jim Hoops, please. 
Thank you, Dr. Winslow. My name is Jim Hoops. I represent an area up in North, way up in Northwest Ohio. It's a very strong egg district, um, and I appreciate the research that's being done here. I feel that the egg community is very aware of what's going on, but we need to continue to communicate on what the egg is doing because the lake is also a very vital part of, uh, of the state. I know the governor is very involved with it. You know, we're looking at the H2 Ohio fund, and as Lou mentioned, waiting for that budget to, uh, to pass so that we have the four state directors, all ladies, so you know something is going to get done with EPA, ODNR, uh, the Egg and the, the Lake Erie Commission, we're going to do a lot of great things, and I support what's going on. So thank you for having us today. Thank you, Representative Hoops. And, and right behind you and Kristen next to you is David Wirt coming from um, Representative Bob Lada's office. Again, uh, I thank you for hosting this today here, uh, and we're all waiting for the information. The key thing I note, uh, Congressman Lada and as well as the rest of our federal officials would be here today, except they're obviously in D.C., uh, so we're here. But the key thing I also note is the familiar faces in the crowd. This is an integrated effort, and from the political side, it's a bipartisan effort uh, across the board uh, for what we're doing here. So again, thank you for hosting. Thank you, David. Um, moving down the line, again, this is a, a, to echo that, we have a lot of, of fantastic individuals in the office. And also coming from um, Governor DeWine's office, we have Ann Vogel in the front of the room here. Kristen, actually, I can share my microphone. Ann. Thanks for the invite to be here. We really, uh, in the administration, are Focus on this H2 Ohio, of course, is one of the governor's first and top priorities. And that's a statewide water quality initiative, but half of it is directed specifically at the lake. And we appreciate the partnership of the universities and the labs and the support of really everybody in this room, elected officials, the environmental community, and others who have really uh, come alongside the ag community. Um, and it's really, um, the momentum is really moving in the right direction. And we're appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Um, also, we have representation from Senator Gary Peters' office in Michigan. So Chris Mattis is here. Chris. Hi, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Yes, uh, my name is Chris Mattis. I work for U.S. Senator Gary Peters. Uh, spent an awful lot of time uh, standing on the shores, the western shores of Lake Erie in Monroe County, and it's very exciting. Thank you for letting me join you all today and get a different perspective on the lake. But obviously, uh, these are important issues that don't impact only uh, folks in Ohio, uh, but Michigan as well. As was mentioned before, Senator Peters is a strong supporter of supporting the Great Lakes, the research that happens here other places, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And actually, one thing I wanted to highlight, uh, actually just yesterday, in the theme of how supporting the Great Lakes is a bipartisan um, regional effort, um, Senator Peters uh, celebrated with Senator Young out of Indiana uh, the Senate Commerce Committee passed uh, a bill that would, uh, for the first time in over two decades, as I understand it, update the Great Lakes Environmental Sensitivity Index maps, which, as I'm sure a lot of folks in this room know better than I do, is a very important resource to make sure that we're looking at the right things, we have the information we need to make right decisions. And as I said, I'm just very happy to learn more and report back to my boss. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Staying on the Michigan theme, we actually have four Michigan agency representatives in the room. So we have folks from the Department of Agricultural, um, the Department of Natural Resources, and also the Department of Environment. So actually, rather than all four, Joe, would you mind saying some words on, on behalf of Michigan real quick and the agencies? Well, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today, Chris, and uh, we are looking forward to working collectively with our partners around the Western Lake Erie Basin, um, obviously Ohio and Indiana, and we're all jointly involved in many projects together. Uh, we're continuing to look forward to working on that and solving this issue moving into the future. Thank you very much. Um, one other that I wanted to make sure we had some other contacts is the National Weather Service is with us today. And so Sarah, if you want to just uh, introduce yourself and say hello also. I'm Sarah Jameson with the National Weather Service over in Cleveland, Ohio. I work closely with Many of you in this room, um, we're helping to make sure that the end users who need information about the HAB are getting the information that they need from our great NOAA partners. So I appreciate the invitation, and I look forward to talking to many of you later today. Great, thank you. Um, and also for one of our Ohio agencies, I'm looking for, I'm not seeing. Is Scott Hale in the room? Where's Scott Hale? Oh, there he is. Scott Hale's in the back. So Scott Hale from um, ODNR Wildlife. Please, Scott. 
Yeah, Chris, I wasn't hiding. Um, I'm Scott Hale from the Ohio Division of Wildlife, and uh, you know the value of Lake Erie fisheries it just just can't be overstated. And um, we're locked on and working hard to keep those things coming. Um, we'll say that we are focused on the H2 Ohio initiative, as our other state agencies, and fully appreciate the importance of water quality in good fishing. Thanks, Chris. Great, thank you, Scott. And then we do have representative, I spoke with him, we have representative from Noah Glarell here in the office too. So folks that made the trip up from um, or across, down and across from uh, Ann Arbor. And so we've got a, a whole team of folks from the Noah Glarell office. So with that, I'm actually going to shift over and we're going to put on the video um, that Congresswoman Kaptur sent us. Justin Chaffin in the back of the room, can you turn that fan? I'm sorry, don't, don't kill me, everybody in the audience. We're going to turn that off because we get a little reverb from that fan. But after we get the video up, um, we'll turn the fan back on for you and then That's it, talking to us. Um, and the password for that is Gibraltar Island, capital G, capital I, 2019. So Gibraltar Island, capital G, capital I, 2019. And then if you're going to be on social media, it's hashtag Habs Forecast, all lowercase. So again, hashtag Habs Forecast, forecast all lowercase. Um, next, I want to introduce um, our Deputy Director from NCOS. But before I say that, there was a lot of kind words um, mentioned by our elected officials and the agencies in the room. Um, Ohio Sea Grant is very happy to host this event and, and, and for us to emcee this event, but clearly the work that's being done and that I'm going to talk about and that's going to be mentioned is done by a whole team of academics across the state, across multiple states. And so I do want to clearly recognize that, uh, you know, this is great to host this event, but this work wouldn't be done and the progress we're making wouldn't be done without a huge team of academics and agencies. So, so thanks for that involvement. And so it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, Margot Schultz um, Haugen. 
and so she's the deputy director of NCOSH, so that's for those of you, I always forget it too, it's the National Center for Coastal Ocean Sciences, and so she's going to say a few words before we bring Laura Johnson up for the nutrient loading today. So, Margo. Uh, my first few quick sound check. Uh, folks hear me in the back? Excellent. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for having me. This is my first year here. Uh, and so, uh, as, as Chris said, my name is Margot Schultagen. I'm the Deputy Director for the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Uh, that We are the science arm of the National Ocean Service. We deliver ecosystem science solutions in support of coastal communities. Uh, and so, oh, okay, thank you. Yes, I need to keep it close. Um, and so, first I wanted to acknowledge the tremendous track record and productivity of the people and the partnerships here working on this important issue. I know in 2009 we issued our first uh, seasonal forecast um, that indicated the Lake Erie HAB bloom location and concentration. Following that in 2012, we issued the first seasonal forecast, which is what we're doing today, that provides more information on future conditions about two months out and how that is a, an important piece of information for resource managers, the tourism industry, to, to prepare for upcoming conditions. And so that's a, a very important piece of information. Um, the forecast has been accurate within 85% of the time, and but we are continuing to work on improvements and, and conduct research so that we can improve that. Um, in 2015, in response to requests for more information earlier, we also started issuing the rolling seasonal forecast in May so that we can provide as much information uh, as early as possible for, for folks to, to plan appropriately. And so while HABs are still a, a major challenge for this area, the focus and research on HAB detection and monitoring is paying off. Uh, water resource managers are able to, to plan for the upcoming season. They're able to uh, store water in low-risk periods. Uh, to issue beach advisories if necessary, uh, and to point and use the, the forecast and imagery um, for recreational boaters and, and fishers to, to send them to hab-free areas. And so this was even true in 2015 when the, the record bloom uh, was a 10.5 on our 10-point scale. So uh, I think it, it's, it's shown its worth. Uh, and so some of the things that we're continuing to focus on and, and research include things like GLURL's 3D model, which will give more information on where HABs are located within the water column. If they're located in the upper part of the water column, obviously that's a problem for recreational boaters and, and fishers. Whereas if it's lower in the water column, then water intake uh, could be a concern and, and water treatment managers need to take appropriate action. Um, and so other things we're working on include uh, autonomous underwater vehicles and miniaturizing and automating toxin detection um, that will provide more information more frequently and for more areas at a much reduced cost than shore and, and ship-based sampling. So that's a, a, an advancement. Uh, we're also working on detection on, on cloudy days and using hyperspectral cameras over water intake areas so that we have more information in nearshore areas, but then also you know, when the satellite images are obstructed by clouds. And so that will provide a, fill a key gap uh, in some of the, the treatment necessary. Um, and finally, another major area of focus is the, the bloom toxicity and trying to develop a, a bloom toxicity forecast. Obviously, that's a, a major factor. Um, not all blooms are toxic. And determining when a bloom is toxic, what triggers that, and determine how toxic it becomes is a, a key piece of information that we're working to try and provide. Uh, and so I'll, I'll finish here by kind of thanking the folks again, uh, acknowledging the value of the partners that, that make this all happen. Um, we're combining the national leadership with the people on the ground uh, so that we can provide as much information as we can. Uh, specifically, I'll close by thanking the researchers, particularly Heidelberg University and Ohio Sea Grant, for providing the information to make the forecast possible. Uh, the water treatment and resource managers that are keeping people safe the communicators and the media that are here to help keep people informed, uh, and finally, the, the federal and, and state legislators for their continued support. Uh, it's, it's very helpful. And a, a final thank you very much to Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Lab for, for hosting the event. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Director.
Um, so without further ado, we're going to call Laura Johnson up, and she's going to bring um, the loading information to everybody. So again, she'll explain in greater detail, but this is some of this information that's critical to the model forecast that you're going to hear from Rick later. So um, Laura Johnson, Director of Heidelberg's National Center for Water Quality Research. Hello, everyone. All right, so it's lovely to see you all again. Um, so just like uh, just like Chris said, I want to tell you a little bit about what's been happening this spring, going all the way back to March. And so, with further ado, I just keep on going in. Oh, see if I remember how to do this. Which one is it? Oh, nope, not that. Mm -hmm. Well, you're just gonna have to wait one more second because I just messed it all up. Oh. Is there a clicker? Anybody? Clicker in the house? Okay. So I just hit down. It has to be specifically over that thing. I'll just keep talking and I'll figure it out. Okay, so um, I, before I show you any data, I have to, of course, remind you what we actually are doing. So we have our Heidelberg Tributary Loading Program. We sample the Maumee River at Waterville, Ohio, but it's only one of 24 stations. We sample lots of places all throughout Ohio and up into Michigan. Um, we collect samples three times a day all year round from these, from these sites using automated samplers. And then we go back um, every week and collect those samples. We bring them back into the lab for analysis of all major nutrients, sediments, and some pesticides even. Uh, we've been sampling in the Maumee River since 1974, um, and so we've got quite a long history of data here. Um, the one thing I do want to point out is that where we are monitoring water quality, USGS is there with their gauging stations giving us water quantity. We need both of these things to talk about loads. For me, thank you. Um, okay, so, and then also before I show you data, I'm going to also remind you of what it is I'm showing you. So, if, as a quick reminder, I'm going to basically only talk about phosphorus today. And of the forms of phosphorus that we can measure, Sorry, it looks a little washed out, but we've got total phosphorus here, right? Now, the total phosphorus um, has the phosphorus that's dissolved, phosphorus attached particles. We get everything that's in that sample. But total phosphorus is essentially the dissolved phosphorus, so what makes it through a filter and into this. You can't see dissolved phosphorus. We care an awful lot about it, though, because it's really bioavailable. And then we also have total particulate phosphorus, anything that gets trapped on the filter. Because of how interesting this year has been, I'm looking at these two forms separately this year. Okay, so I'm not going to show you any total phosphorus. You're going to see dissolved reactive phosphorus or total particulate phosphorus. But then I'm also going to show you total bioavailable phosphorus. And as a quick reminder, total bioavailable phosphorus is simply the phosphorus that is available for algae to use that actually makes it all the way out to the lake from Waterville. So it ends up being pretty much all of the DRP, right? It moves pretty easy, very easy to use, and about 8% of the particulate phosphorus. And so look for these little guys so you know which one I'm talking about. So let's start with total bioavailable phosphorus for this year. And so you can see this is the cumulative total bioavailable phosphorus load. You remember what that means is that we add up every single day starting in March going through the end of July um, and see how it accumulates. Right? The red is uh, 2019. Clearly we're not at the end of July yet. So to get through the end of the month, we use data from the National Weather Service Ohio River Forecast Center to then project what the loads are going to be. You can see in green the maximum loads that we've had. Basically, it's 2011 and then 2015. And then you can see the minimum loads, which is basically 2012. So a couple interesting things. First of all, remember if you see these big increases in loads, that's pulse loading. That means it's non-point sources. It means it's phosphorus is coming off the land. Okay. The other thing that's really interesting is starting in about mid-April, maybe even going back to March, but especially mid-April, all the way up through about the end of June, it basically had a continual input from the river. Like it's like, it basically just rained that entire time and input an awful lot of phosphorus. If we compare to past years, we see what we end up is, is around 2017, higher than 2018. You can look at it in a different way and say, oh look, see we're at 454 metric tons of total bioavailable phosphorus as of June 7th. Right? That is higher than 2014, 2008. Not quite as high as 2017, 11, or 15. But you also know it had this line here, the 600 metric tons. And I put that there because 
based off of all of the flow that we've gotten out of the Maumee River, just the amount of water, we would have expected 600 metric tons, but we didn't get that. We got 454, right? So this is a pretty big difference. Well, how did I determine this? And I want to show you that real quick. Well, it's pretty simple, as a matter of fact. We have um, total bioavailable phosphorus load here versus discharge. And you can see if we go back through time, it has, uh, through the past 18 years, it's a really, really tight relationship, right? So basically what we can do here is predict, oh, based off of this discharge, this is the load we would expect. Got our two targets here, the static target, right? If we exceed that, it's like above 2012. We have our moving flow rate and mean target. For those of you who really love to think about figures, and I'm sure it's not very many of you in the room, where these lines cross is 2008. And um, because I did not do the animations perfectly correct, this is where we would have expected 2019 to be, right? Right there, smack on the line. What we actually got was this. We're down here. So we are about 24% lower than we would have expected based off of how much rain we got. We should be up there similar to 2011 and 2015, and we don't have that much load. But I want to remind you, total bioavailable phosphorus is a mix of dissolved phosphorus and particulate phosphorus, right? Well, let's look at them separately and see how they compare. And so you can see here, dissolved phosphorus, total particulate phosphorus, all of this change in total bioavailable phosphorus happened because of decreases in DRP loads. There's a decrease of about 31% uh, lower than what we would have expected. So we expect to be here, we're actually down here. Total particulate phosphorus is basically right on the line, exactly where we would have expected. So there you go. That's DRP and total phosphorus. Um, these lower DRP concentrations, we think, are associated with all of the troubles that agriculture has been through over the entire past year. I'm not talking about just this spring. It goes all the way back to last fall. Last fall was really wet. Harvest was late, went way into December. I was talking to one friend. He said he was harvesting in January of last year. So we didn't get that fall fertilizer application that we typically get. We know that um, it's been hard to get on the fields this spring as well. So any other application is basically didn't happen. OK. So let's now compare these years to past years. And then we'll, we'll flip it over to Rick. OK, so this is showing flow, discharge, water volume, whatever you want to say, uh, for the spring period, averaged over five-year increments. So you can see we have a you know, five-year average here with some error bars that, that dictate the variation in those five years. I'll note that this last one, because Chris picked it up in my practice talk, I'm only noting it because of this, that this is actually only four years. It's 2015 to 2018 because I wanted to keep 2019 separate. This line is 2008, and you can see as of July 7th, we're at 4.9 cubic kilometers, which is an awful lot of water. It's not higher than what we have seen in the past four years because that includes 2015, which was even more water, just by a teeny bit. So we're talking about a lot of water this year that has come through the Maumee River. Um, the other thing I want to point out is this increase in discharges that we've seen over the past 15 years, because you're going to see this in all of our loads. It stopped moving. Next up, we have total particulate phosphorus. That's perfect. Thank you. Don't know what I did here, but that's fine. Um, total particulate phosphorus, um, I forgot that we don't have animation, so nothing's popping and you're seeing it all at once. But nonetheless, what you see is you know, similar patterns. We've got their target loads here. We see that increase that I pointed out that you see because of discharge. This year, we're pretty high right, for total particulate phosphorus, but because of the amount of rain we have, that's basically right where we would expect it to be. So we're at 1,650 metric tons currently. Would have expected it to be about 1,720. That's pretty much the same. Um, and well above the, the loading target here. Flow weighted means you see have a general decreasing pattern. You know, we did try to control soil erosion back in the 80s and 90s, and it continued to do that. Been pretty flat for the past you know, 15, 20 years. Um, so what this tells us is this increase is because of change in flow, not because of change in concentration. Interesting thing to point out. Concentrations here are a little high, but about where we would expect, well above the target of 0.18. Worked that time. Ta -da. Okay, dissolved phosphorus. You see our U-shaped patterns here, right uh, above the target. You ended up here. 
this is where we would expect it. This is basically on average of what we've seen for the past four years. So we would have been well up in sort of the high range. This would have been 2015, remember, is in that, that error bar. So um, it's not the highest we've seen. 326 metric tons currently. We were expecting 470. Um, and that's above the target, which is 186. And then here's our uh, flow rate mean concentrations. You see we dropped below the target here in the 80s, increase and sort of flatten off. Um, this shows again that these increases in loads um, in the past 15 years are mostly because of flow, um, even though our concentrations are plenty high. <laughs> and you can see how our concentration is lower than what we've seen in the past 10 or 15 years on average, 0 0.067. We would have expected 0 0.096. So it's still above the target, but goodness, it's an awful lot closer than it could have been, right? So, so that is the, the interesting news that we have for this. And I think that's all I have. So what we're going to do is I'm going to come back and talk to you after Rick about all the implications of what this might mean so we can have an interesting discussion later. But we didn't want to hold back on the forecasting any longer. Good. So I'm going to hand the microphone, as Laura indicated, to Rick Stump. And so the way we're doing this is he's going to give you the number. Um, Noah will actually release the official forecast right at noon. So we wanted folks that are in the room to see this information a little earlier. But again, as Laura suggested, as soon as this um, forecast number is out there, Laura's going to come back and talk about some of the trends she's seen in the landscape and in the watershed that might explain um, what we're seeing. So without further ado, and most of the folks in the room know Rick Stump. He's a rock star in this part of the country. So everybody, Rick Stump. Thankfully, I get through the airport without anyone stopping me. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a, a whole group of people in order to get to the forecast. I can't emphasize enough the value that Laura Johnson, the Heidelberg Group, does because while we we can measure the the blooms from satellite, we need the nutrient loads. That's and this detail is phenomenal. There's many places in the country that dearly need this kind of data. Um, we use an ensemble from several different groups and also some other forecasts and work as well. So there's a whole list of people here. All should be recognized. Some of the people in the room as well. All right. Let's get the right arrow. Which one do I do? Which side arrow? OK. Which one do I push on? That one? That one should work. All right. So just to show where, just to capture last year where it was, just a couple of slides here. This is our, this is the, since we started the satellite data in 2002, this is all of 17 years. And 2008 was uh, in, in the middle in the, in the whole bloom scale. You can see that uh, the extent, fairly large extent, but not high biomass. There's, it's just mostly greens in there. And you compare that to, say, 2015, the big year, much bigger extent and a lot of high biomass area at that same time. 2015 and 11 were the two biggest blooms. 2011, of course, went way past Cleveland um, late in the season. So that captures there, and here we go. Overall, in 2018, it was a bit unusual. Um, when uh, when Barco had mentioned that we uh, we had missed, we missed the forecast last year. We forecast a worse bloom than there actually was. Um, and there's a few things on that, somewhat unusual. Um, first, uh, the error there. It was the earliest we'd seen the bloom start. It actually had started in late June. So when we actually had this last year, we had a, a developed bloom in place. And then that has not happened to any of the other years we've done this. Um, part of that was with the, um, it was the weather. The lake warmed up really fast last year. And this graph over here shows 2018. If you look, there was a big peak in late May and then June. It was all above these other years. This year, by contrast, started very cold. And it's just, it's just now caught up. So the lake's now up to normal temperature, but we've had a cold spring all through June. It was also the earliest, 2018 was the earliest ending of a bloom. There were high winds in September, and they didn't stop. Normally, there's maybe one event in September, and then it calms down. And we find we get a, like a secondary bloom in, in September. And so part of the, it's possible, part of the difference in the forecast, I will still say we missed the forecast, but as a mitigating factor, it may be the bloom did not last as long because their severity is mostly the extent and the duration. And so we had a very, the bloom pretty much disappeared in September. 
so that, that wind event may have knocked it down. That's probably one thing that's good. Pretty bad for boaters if it's windy. I don't, um, Dave and Paul, I don't know how you're doing last fall going out fishing in September. Hopefully you could get people out without them being seasick. Um, and then um, <clears throat> as far as the, we use an ensemble of models and there were some noticeable difference in the models. Some were, over, some were much higher than others and we've reviewed that and some have been switching out. So we continue to review the ensemble of models to address that to try to capture models that get closer over time. Each year we do this, we get better. So the models come from several different places. Um, all right. So what about this year? Um, just to recap, just to bring you there, very wet. This is the um, very high discharge. But on the other hand, you look at the bioavailable phosphorus. And so on the discharge, we're, between, we're close to 2011, 2015, but on the phosphorus, we're, we're well down below those those years. That's uh, the key big question issue. It was very wet, the second wettest May ever in Northwest Ohio, Ohio, and April to June was this little thing here, all that dark blue is, I don't know if I can do this, well above average in Northwest Ohio. Anyone up here doesn't need me to tell you that, but just a reminder, it was soggy up here. Um, by the way, I'm in Maryland and we had our wettest 365 days ever last this last year. And three days ago, we set our all-time rainfall. We had four inches of rain in an hour and a half. Um, yeah, that was <laughs> way off topic, though. But rainfall has been a problem across the country, actually, this past spring, everywhere. So we use an ensemble models. We have two models, uh, what we call TPB and our P2 model. They're, they're completely different formulations. Um, there's a, a model that's jointly done by Michigan, NC State, and uh, Noah Glarel, which uses a Bayesian approach to, to develop this. And then there's a Limnotech, which uses a response lobe curve. So they're all, they're all different constructions, each one of these. And that's an important part when you're doing ensemble. You don't do an ensemble of the same, same form of model, just tweaked. You really want different types of models in order to, to assure you're bracketing what's happening. Um, so here's, here's the forecast number, what we're waiting for. So I guess then I can put the slide. Um, uh, severity is seven and a half. Um, and the model, we put us between seven and eight, but a seven and a half forecast. There's an uncertainty range here of as low as six and up to nine. I'll touch on that in a minute. And you can see this, this would put us below the 2017 bloom. Uh, indefinitely well below the 2011 and 2015 blooms. Um, just some comments here on some things that have, are happening. You've all noticed the lake is at an all-time record high, and it's um, about two and a half feet deeper than the 2008 to 2014 blooms. So there is more water. Western Basin is about, on average, about 20 feet deep. So that's about 10% more water in the Western Basin. Also, tied into that, all the lakes are high. And so Detroit River is actually bringing all the water from all the other Great Lakes through. And it's running much higher than it has been. It's about 15% above um, the last couple of years and almost 30% more water than 2005 to 14. The extra water there is actually equal to a large flow event out of the Maumee River. There's a huge amount of water comes through Detroit. Now, why do I mention this? Well, Detroit. River is draining from Lake Huron. Lake Huron is low nutrients. So there's a dilution factor with this and a residence time as well. So there's a lot of low nutrient water flowing through. Granted, it's in the upper part of the western basin, not the southern part. But some of that with wind patterns, they push the plume south, north, there is some mixing. Um, so we, this is a consideration we have not had to capture in the models, but it's one we need to, to, to think about. We estim I'd estimate a possibility we might be about 10, we could be as much as 10% lower below what we're us forecasting as a result of this, which gets to that low end, I should back up here, gets to that lower end of the uh, around six as an uncertainty. Um, I should also say again, as Laura and I've talked about, we're talking about total bioavailable phosphorus, if, um, and that is the key driver for this because a lot of the phosphorus isn't bioavailable, but we certainly recognize there could be some mechanics with total phosphorus, particular phosphorus we don't fully understand, which could influence the other side of this. So um, 
the the figures, by the way, NOAA is releasing these um, on on our press page. So if anyone wants a high quality copy, you can you can get that. So you don't have to capture the picture. Now Laura talked about the the difference, and I mentioned also how much uh, the expected phosphorus we have. So we ran the numbers on that, and so the bloom this year, if we had had the expected bioavailable phosphorus, we would be near the potential record bloom for this year. So we're looking at um, so the that's the in a sense we have a, a situation where we're looking at a potential seven and a half bloom, but we could have been looking at a much worse bloom given the amount of rainfall and discharge we saw into the lake. The second part is if we got we we if we got to the full forty percent reduction over the two thousand eighteen load, where we would likely be is still a noticeable bloom, but it'd be about a five on the scale. Still um, not um, insignificant, but um, even much lower than than what we'd see, what we'd expect to see this year. So we're we're not as bad as we could have been because of the um, the amount of water flowing into the lake. We could have had we could expect to see a much worse bloom than we are forecasting, but we still could get further down on the line as a result. I think. Um, oh, one last thing here. We produce a regular bulletin you can subscribe to. It comes out uh, twice a week and uh, shows the location of the bloom and the forecast several days in advance. Um, if you you just if you type into your browser NOAA HAB Lake Erie forecast, you will get to it in short order. This is actually one of the bulletin first of July. There was a little bit of the Sandusky Bay bloom pushed out by one of those high flow events, but we're 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 still not quite um, starting into bloom season. So. I think uh, last bit here, severity is seven and a half. Discharge were equal to 2011, 2015, but the bioavailable is down. We have some uncertainty from the high lake levels, which may possibly reduce the severity. Um, I can't always emphasize the bloom is not everywhere in the lake. It moves and patches around with the wind. So please assume you can find places to boat on the lake where there is no bloom. You can find places to recreate. Um, most of the lake will be fine all the time, but please um, monitor the bloom with our with our data and any other information. So it's possible to, to take best advantage of the lake. It's a beautiful resource. Um, I I'm not from Ohio, and I've really grown to love being up here and seeing this lake and being out here. It's really really a great place. You do have a great lake. So turn it back to Laura. Good, as Laura's coming back up again, just to hit on some of those other sources. Um, so for the EPA, it does have a website that shows you where there are um, detections for some of the water treatment facilities. And also the Department of Health has a beach guard website. So if you go to the beach guard website, it'll tell you where, which beaches have blooms present and even indication of toxin levels. So look in the Department of Health beach guard and then EPA has a, um, a, a finished in a source water levels of toxins um, that they track for drinking water consumption. So we'll come back to Laura and let her round out her PowerPoint presentation. You just can't get rid of me, you know. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you a variety of things and thoughts that are not entirely all pulled together yet. And so the, before I get into any detail here, what I want to remind you all is that everything that we have so far is very preliminary. If you saw, I did the most recent updates yet this week. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to be looking into why we've seen these decreases in DRP load and what the implications are as we move on through the rest of probably this year and maybe for multiple years, because it's very interesting. But with that, I want to bring up two very important points um, that I think is, um, is something that we need to make sure everyone's sort of like on the same page about. So the first is that a 30% decrease in DRP load is substantial, right? So you would, might think that that's not that, you know, that you would have expected more. But actually, I I'm going to show you why I think that that is actually very, a pretty big de decrease. Um, and it tells us a bit about how the current year fertilizer application really does matter. The second one is that nutrient management is key, right? And hopefully you guys will be with me on the same page there and, and that we need to be thinking about subsurface placement. And when I say subsurface placement, I mean injecting two inches below the surface, not going out there and moldboard plowing. Okay. So 
let us do a quick reminder of how phosphorus works in agriculture. I'm sure you guys love to think about this all the time. So this is a figure from Lindsay Peace, and she was a postdoc with Kevin King. So she took all of Kevin King's edgy field data and organized it in terms of a phosphorus balance. And what you see here is a variety of inputs. We have fertilizer manure that comes into this ag field, atmospheric deposition, and then there's a variety of outputs. The biggest one being crop removal, and then we have hydrologic loss, surface runoff, and leaching or tile drainage, so that you know subsurface drainage. And then you can take all these inputs and subtract all these outputs, and you get your phosphorus balance. So you can see, as an average across all these edge of field sites, they're finding a slightly positive phosphorus balance. Well, this is a little bit misleading because it's being driven by one higher application due to manure. And if you look more closely at their fields, they actually find 63% of the edge of field sites are um, negative phosphorus balance. But even with that, across all of these fields, there's always hydrologic loss. Negative phosphorus balance or not, there's always something coming off. But that hydrologic loss, so the surface runoff or the tile drain runoff, is loosely um, correlated to, so driven by the phosphorus balance and or fertilizer application, because they're kind of the same. All right, so this is a very simplistic view of agricultural phosphorus. What it's missing is the storage in the soil, right? Phosphorus is stored in the soil, too. So you don't see that in this type of a view. So just a quick reminder, if we um, think about how we manage phosphorus in typical agriculture, what we do is we try to maintain a bank of crop available phosphorus so that if you have a terrible year like this year where you couldn't get any applications on, you're not going to have a yield loss because of phosphorus. Right? And that if you have multiple years, because a lot of times people work in crop rotations with their phosphorus applications, you shouldn't have a yield problem. Okay? And so that maintenance range is somewhere around in here, right, where phosphorus applications that you put on the field equal removal. And then if you move down this lane here, you get into this critical level. So this is when your soil tests are low enough that you might have a yield loss because you don't have enough phosphorus. And so that's the buildup range. You apply more than is being removed. And then we also have the top of this maintenance limit where you have more than enough phosphorus. It's economically, it's dumb to apply anymore because you're just wasting your time and effort. Um, and it's also not so great for the environment, so you should be applying less than what you're removing. So I'm going through all of these details to tell you that typically it's very hard in the phosphorus world to separate one year from the next year because we're trying to bank phosphorus in our soils and crop available phosphorus is, you know, essentially DRP, that stuff that's easier to run off. Okay, so because of this, I would say a 30% decrease in DRP loads in one year is um, it tells us a lot, it's, it's big, right? I w if you had asked me last year, and I think I got last, asked last year, what do, what, if we didn't apply any phosphorus, what do we think would happen? I'd be like, I don't think you're gonna see any change because we always have a lot of phosphorus on the soil. That's just how we manage it, right? Nope, I was wrong, 30% decrease. This means we can make improvements much quicker than we might have expected, which is great news, right? But why are we seeing this decrease is the big question here. And originally I would have said, well, it's gotta be soil test phosphorus because dissolved phosphorus and phosphorus in soil are tightly linked. You know, when you have big losses of dissolved phosphorus it's because there's too much phosphorus in your soil. So I'm showing you this figure. This is a figure from Steve Coleman's group. He's the soil fertility specialist with Ohio State. And he's showing essentially years of experiments on experimental farms in three different counties, Clark County, Wayne County, and Wood County. And so you can see we've got the maintenance range, the top of it and the critical limit, and we have fertilizer, fertilizer rates at 0% and red, the blue is at one time crop removal, and then the yellow is two time crop removal. And the thing I want you to focus on is the red, right? So there are some places, like in Clark County, where you miss an application, you see these deep drops in soil test phosphorus. But honestly, from one year to the next, if you get to Wayne, and especially if you're in Wood County, there's not that much of a change, right? You can see it changed, you know, Wood County goes for five years before we have this big drop off, right? And so it could be soil tests if, if fields are like this, but it might not be. And so that brings up another point. Well, what is the other option here? And I wanted to, before we move on, just note really quickly that across all of these rates, because they, you know, only here do we even get below critical limit, there was no differences in yields, okay? So, 
this year, what I think that means is for farmers, we wouldn't expect a yield hit because of phosphorus. There's probably going to be yield problems for a whole wide range of other reasons. Probably not going to be a phosphorus issue. Okay, so then if it's not, I messed it up again. So if it's not, um, there we go. So if it's not uh, soil test phosphorus, then what is it? And I think it's a placement issue. So just a quick reminder, if you've heard me give this talk before, then you've heard this hypothesis before. But what we think is going on, so if we have our ag fields here, we have subsurface runoff and surface runoff, um, that if you zoomed in on the soil, that we would see an accumulation of phosphorus on the surface. It's called soil phosphorus stratification. And that would look something like this. This is a whole bunch of measurements of phosphorus in the top one inch of soil, showing it's two to three times higher than what you get at the bottom of a soil core. It's twice as high as the estimate if you looked at zero to eight inches. So basically, phosphorus is on the surface. Well, why do we care about that? Well, we care because rainwater interacts most heavily with the surface of the soil. And then, when we get into our agricultural fields, we get in these big macro pores. We have these heavy clay soils. We get these big cracks and fissures. And that can lead to things that look like this. Here's a big cracks and fissures. These are courtesy of Kevin King. That delivers that now highly concentrated surface runoff through a macro pore, through a tile drain, and out to the ditch, and ultimately to the lake. So this is one of the reasons, given all of the information we understand about agriculture, one of the reasons why we think we're seeing these losses of DRP in the first place, that it's all in the wrong spot. All right, so what that says is decreased DRP that we see this year, rather than being a change in an entire soil test over that whole core, could simply be because we didn't surface apply phosphorus fertilizer, so we didn't re-enrich this first one inch, and it had a chance to move down into the soil core some. Um, and that's because of that lack of application, most likely last fall. So this is really important. If this is true, and we need to get some background data to show this, because it tells us of all of these four R's of nutrient management, first of all, nutrient management on its own as a first step, which is what we always say, nutrient management is first step. Make sure you're not over applying and you're putting it in the right place. Well, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we should be doing. We know this. We know rate is still important because probably some soil tests went down. We don't want to have soil tests too high. But I think what we overlook oftentimes, especially when it comes to incentives, is placement. And like I said, I want to reiterate, placement being using high-tech toolbars to get your phosphorus below the top two inches of soil. So what that would say is maybe we need to buy more tractors for people to try out subsurface placement, right? Um, and so, but let's get more information about everything that's been going on to better understand it. But at least we know all this emphasis on nutrient management is well placed. And so with that, I want to give you some good news. And the good news is that there's been a lot of interest in, in 4 R's in nutrient management. We've got the 4R Nutrient Stewardship Certification Program, which is an agricultural retailer certification, you know, so that they make sure retailers who are applying these, these nutrients are doing so with the 4R principles. There's the Agricultural Fertilizer Certification Program that's run through OSU Extension, which basically is a rule that if you are applying your own nutrients, you have to be certified to do so, and you get all the education about the best practices in doing it. And then most recently formed is the Ohio Agriculture Conservation Initiative, which is a diverse group of stakeholders. We include stuff like ag commodity groups, Ohio, like environmental type groups, NGOs, researchers, all along the spectrum, all coming together. First, to do have two different things. First thing is to get an understanding of what nutrient management and other conservation practices are happening on the ground. Maybe that sounds silly, but it's almost impossible to know nutrient management efforts because you can't see them. And then the second one is to build a farmer for like certification program, kind of like the forest certification program, but including other uh, conservation efforts as well, so they can show what you know farmers can identify themselves as doing a good job. So, with that, that's all the that's all the implications and feeling I have for now. Uh, but if you need information or how to get in touch with me, I have this here. Thank you, Laura. Um, so we're going to roll into one last presentation, and, and it's uh, one that I'm going to give. If I can have somebody pull it up for me, because I'll break this machine. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, all the work that's going on is, is not at one university or not at one agency. This is happening across the entire state and outside of our state. And so I just want to take 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, to kind of give you an overview of harmful algal bloom research that's going on in Ohio right now. Um, I've done this in previous uh, HAB forecasts. 
there are a new suite of projects that are going on right now, 21 or 22, so I thought I would give you a, just a really high level glimpse into those. And I've attached the university and the lead PI on each one of these projects. This PowerPoint, like the other two, will be on the website here for you to download. But I encourage you to, if you're curious about one of these projects, to, to reach out to those um, researchers um, on, your, on your own. And hopefully I won't break this. Look at that, out of the gates. Okay, um, so without animation, again, I didn't recognize that. First thing I wanted to mention is Senate Bill 299, which was under Senator Gardner, now um, the Chancellor of the Ohio Department of Higher Education, um, and uh, Senator uh, O'Brien. But this was uh, Senate Bill 299, Clean Lake Ohio, or Clean Lake 2020 plan, that was $36 million put in play. If you're not familiar with this, 20 million of this was going to agencies to work on nutrient runoff. 10 million of this was going towards our handling of dredge material. About 3 million was going to soil and water conservation districts. And then 2.65 million is coming to Ohio Sea Grant Stone Lab to build new lab capacity and stream monitoring. I'm happy to inform you that Justin Chapman, our research coordinator, who you'll hear from um, later today, um, has been contacting researchers throughout the state to see what that lab capacity looks like. We want to make sure that we're building lab space and outfitting it with equipment that can serve the entire state. Um, the next one is, the, if you're not aware, a, a team, you can see EPA, NOAA, BGSU, UT, others worked on an open lake impairment designation. So the EPA was asked to find a methodology and a criteria for which we could designate the open waters of the Western Basin and Lake Erie impaired for recreational purposes. Um, that publication is um, down here. It's, it's kind of overlap, but science meets policy, so a framework for determining impairment. So there is a publication out for that. I also wanted to reference, I think many of you in the room know this, there was a white paper that had been floating around talking about ways that we can get to a reduction in nutrient loading. That white paper has actually been submitted and is now a publication in the Journal of Great Lakes Research. So that's uh, in peer review. So again, lots of players, Ohio Sea Grant, National Wildlife Federation. I know Gail Hess is in the room today, one of those authors. So I wanted you to make sure, uh, you wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Um, this year, September 12th is the date, but we're having our annual conference in Toledo, one day conference. Um, it's the State of Science Understanding HABs. Um, so it is on the 12th. It's in the Stranahan Theater again. Please come out. This is gonna be broken into three sessions again, give you insight on what's going on at your field some new collaborative partnerships. And right now we have an early thumbs up from um, four directors from our four agencies in Ohio. So EPA, DNR, Ag, and the Lake Erie Commission that are gonna be on a panel that will field questions from um, the audience and people that have RSVP to that event. So um, the save the date is out, but the RSVP is coming shortly. Um, this was mentioned earlier also as one of the products that are out there, EcoHab. Uh, so Dr. Justin Chaffin, actually Justin's in the back of the room, if you could wave your hand up. Um, many of you guys know Justin. Him and a team of researchers you're seeing here, Limnotech, BGSU, Michigan Tech, UT, Wayne State, um, have a three-year project to basically layer a toxicity forecast on top of this harmful algal bloom forecast. So what you're seeing now is an indication of likely bloom size, um, but size does not correlate to toxicity. Big blooms aren't always highly toxic, small blooms aren't always low toxicity. So over the next two, three years, that team will be working to identify toxicity loads. I did want to mention, I know Anne's here today and, and Joy Mullenix is going to be here and Luann Cook from, from the governor's office. Just want to give a heads up of all the efforts that are going right now in the legislature on H2O, um, H2O Ohio. And so basically effort to protect the water quality in the state. And I do want to mention that this is important. Lake Erie is part of that portfolio, but anytime you talk to um, Governor DeWine and his staff, this is an entire state issue. We know that two-thirds of the state, you know, enter into the Ohio River and then has um, impacts, potential impacts downstream. And then the last one I want to mention is, again, we are still rolling forward with the Ohio Department of Higher Education Harmful Algal Bloom Research Initiative. So this has been $2 million invested in the state's researchers since 2015. So the Toledo occurrence in 2014, and then $2 million became available in 15 and every year since. Um, currently, it's in um, the, the governor's biennial budget that's still going through that process um, for another two million for the next two years. But this is what I wanna jump into now for us is um, the goals of this harmful algal bloom research initiative. So basically four major focus areas. And the first one is to basically produce safe drinking water. Roughly 11 million people rely on Lake Erie for drinking water. And so what we need to know is the tools, technologies, and the training to make sure that our water treatment facilities can remove the toxin if it is present. 
The other one is assessing human health risks and impacts. So what levels pose risk and what kind of risk? And so I'll talk about some of those projects that are ongoing right now. The other one is how blooms behave. When I reference this, this is how do we know when the bloom's gonna show up? When will it dissipate? When is it gonna become toxic? When is it not gonna be toxic? When is it at the surface of the water? When is it at depth? So a lot of information about how that bloom behaves is being funded through this initiative. And the last one is assessing nutrient runoff. So what can we do um, in our suburban and urban communities, but also on the agricultural lands to slow that movement of nutrients off the fields? I cannot stress enough that this has been collaborative. Actually, I'm in the process right now of trying to get two dates set up in the end of July to meet with all four agencies again, in this scenario, health, EPA, DNR, and ag, to get around the table. This isn't research funded just for research sake. All the priorities that go out um, that academics apply for grant money to solve are set by the state agencies. And when those proposals are submitted for review, it is some academics, but also the state agencies that are around the table to determine what projects um, warrant the quickest attention. And so there is great collaborative priority setting, but then the information coming out of these projects is shared across academics, agencies, producers, and numerous stakeholders, many of which are in the room. So we've got you know, Larry Fletcher's here from, from the Visitor Bureau, and we've got Charter Captain representation here, and so um, we've got a lot of individuals that care about the health of the lake and access to the lake. And I can't stress enough, again, I'm up here talking about this, but this is ma managed funds by both Ohio Sea Grant and the University of Toledo. Clearly that university is in the epicenter with the Maumee River, and so they've been playing a critical role in helping set the priorities, review the proposals, and manage these proposals. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, on these because you guys don't wanna sit around and hear the detail of all 22 or 8. 20 or 22 projects, so I'm gonna run through them real quickly. But again, I can't stress enough the collaboration. All the universities at the bottom have either a PI or a co-PI on these grants. The four agencies to the right are involved in priority setting. On the left, we do have some federal involvement. You're seeing USGS and the C grant programs and the NSF funding. And then in the middle, I just wanted to show again, we have great relationships and partnerships with our NGOs across the state. So National Wildlife Federation and and um, TNC, and I know we have the Ohio Environmental Council is present here in the room too, and so those programs are stepping up and helping with this communication. And then the Farm Bureau is there, and I just use that as an indication of us trying to embrace the agribusinesses and the, and the producers as we move forward. I oftentimes find myself saying that sometimes the science that we find in our, in our academic institutions and in our labs, you know, maybe the solution from a scientific perspective is easy, but getting that solution into the hands of people that can use it isn't sometimes. So having those stakeholders at the tables is, is, is critical. So here they are. Again, I'm not gonna go into great detail on these, but I did want you to know the ones that are currently going on right now. So they have a year under their belt. They're starting into their second field season. So we're looking at the drivers of saxitoxin production. Most of you in the room are familiar with microcystis producing microcystin. That's the toxin we're typically worried about in Lake Erie. But this is a statewide initiative. So we do see the production of saxitoxin in our inland reservoirs and inland rivers. So we're doing some of that work. That's BGSU, Tim Davis, who is here with us today. He's in the back of the room. Um, we've got models to simulate um, how a conservation action might change tile drainage. Many of you have seen some of the ensemble model work that's trying to show how we can get to a 40% reduction by doing different BMPs on the landscape. We haven't really modified or looked at that model in greater detail to see how it impacts runoff through the drain tiles. A design and launch of an actual satellite. So we have a group out of University of Cincinnati that's developing a CUBE satellite that has been through its engineering phases and, and might be in orbit here soon, taking uh, more data in addition to the satellites that Rick uses. Some funds going to Heidelberg to ex expand their fantastic operation at the Water Quality Center and the tributary loading. I mentioned the harmful algal bloom impairment criteria, so the information that we, uh, a bunch of scientists, again, UT, BGSU, and others, um, to get this criteria for open water designation, we're actually using some grant money to figure out um, some more information about that, get some more underpinning science and understand the dynamics. Um, for example, one thing is what one researcher might find and define a scum on the surface of the water might be something different than another person. And so we're actually developing a method to measure what we call a quote-unquote scum. Um, on-farm manure management practices. So we're looking at how can we change how we apply manure and how that relates to dissolved phosphorus runoff. That work's coming out of OSU with Dr. Harold Keener. Uh, mapping of agricultural BMPs. So we have folks in UT actually out in the field driving up and down the county roads to look at BMP placement. And then when we find where there are epicenters of this and maybe places that aren't as prevalent with application to do some one-on-one um, -on -one interviews and some case studies to figure out why perhaps those behaviors aren't being adapted. Spatial distribution for manure. 
we know that when manure is produced, it's a great nutrient. So if the field needs phosphorus, it's a great addition. But we need to figure out, can we transport that manure far enough so that we're not putting it on the same fields over and over again? So we're trying to build a distribution model for manure. Tracking and attenuation of nutrient loads. So we actually have out of BGSU a Bob Midden that's working on a proprietary product that actually um, holds on to some of the phosphorus to keep it on the field long enough so that when the, when the crops need it, they can use it. Biosensors, um, so we're actually developing techni technology for almost near real-time detection of cyanobacteria or cyanotoxins. So right now, most of our scientists and labs are using Braxis kits and things like that that take somewhere between three and six hours to get a result back. These water treatment plants need real-time turnaround results, and so we're looking for um, developing tools to do that. Um, the one that was new on our radar because of earlier rounds of Ohio Department of Higher Education work is we knew that water treatment plants could remove the toxin, so you weren't drinking it. But the sludge that comes out of that process, in some instances, was allowed to be applied land for growing crops. We discovered from some of that research that if there is microcystin in that land applied sludge, the plants that you're growing on there can take it up. So now we're trying to look at the fate and persistence of those toxins in the sludge that comes out of a drinking water facility. Um, that's coming out of OSU, a, guy, a gentleman named Dr. Nick Basta. Um, we do know that a lot of the toxins in these blooms are actually in the cells themselves, so not floating freely in the water. And so one of the um, indications of toxicity is when those cells die or lice or burst, that toxin is released. So out of BGSU, Dr. Mike McKay and his colleagues are looking at, can we measure the number of viruses that are in that bloom to give us an indication of when the toxicity might elevate? So we're trying to find different ways to predict when the toxins might arrive and show up. Powder activated carbon. Fancy name for charcoal. How much charcoal do you put in a water drinking facility to bind and remove those toxins? We have good indications on how to do that for microcystin, but not yet for saxitoxin. Out of Toledo, Dr. Jason Huntley is working on how we can develop a biofilter. So can we put organisms in a water treatment facility biofilter so that as the water's running through, they remove the toxins? Sensors for detecting the toxins in humans. So when you ingest the toxin, that toxin will get converted metabolically to another format. So can we find a test that we can take a blood and urine sample and in near real time determine if that individual was exposed to that toxin or not? And some stuff on airborne dispersal. We know a lot of people that are recreating on Lake Erie as they're out on their jet skis and motorboats are just lying on the beach and the waves are crashing. Are those toxins being aerosolized and how might they affect people that are using the lake? Um, biomarkers, so people that we know that have existing a liver cancer, can we find any markers in their system that they've been acutely or chronically exposed to toxins? We're really concerned about that population that has pre-existing liver conditions because this is a liver toxin. Looking for people that have pre-existing liver disease, can we find therapies to help those individuals deal with potential toxin exposure? Inflammatory bowel disease is pretty prevalent in the, in the Northwest Ohio, and so we're trying to look at ways to see how microcystin affects people that already suffer from this ailment of inflammatory bowel disease. And last but not least, we're looking at our fish. We need to know as these fish are swimming around in these blooms uh, with or without toxins, how is it going to affect the way that they, they function, how they grow, and even their survival. So this work coming out of Ohio State University, um, Stu Ludson's lab, his aquatic ecology lab. Um, so a lot, I know that's a lot to go on, but I did want to show you the breadth of some of these projects are working on nutrient reduction, some of them are working on human health, some of them are more working on how do we treat the water more effectively. So this is the current suite of projects, and as I said, we're trying to meet with the agency, either directors or their delegates, to set priorities for the next pool of 1.9 million, basically, is going to be competed. And so a lot of stuff is going on from, I mean, the governor's H2 Ohio initiative to um, you know, uh, a lot of stuff through ODHE and, and some movement. And so I just wanted to, to make you aware that, you know, we do have heavy loading. You've seen the forecast of the 7.5, but there is a lot of amazing things going on in the background in our academic and agencies in the state of Ohio. So with that, the way we've historically done this is, is we're just going to field questions from the audience. So we have a couple microphones that will float around. Is Dr. Kristen Fussell still here? Good. So and I should always introduce Kristen at the beginning. <laughs> Kristen is the Assistant Director of Administration, but um, research. So these projects that I just listed up here, I mean, I can rattle off the names, but she knows all the researchers doing the work, who's got the money, who's spending it, what are the results. 
Kristen is critically important to not only uh, Sea Grant and Stone Lab, but to the work that's going on in harmful algal bloom. So Dr. Kristen Fossil. And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of alternate. We're going to have people raise their hands here in the room, and we'll get you a microphone to ask a question. Um, we're going to have either Rick or Laura, or if I can, field it. But you are surrounded in a room here of just amazing content experts, again, from all the universities that have been mentioned today. So we'll try and field your question um, with the audience that we have here. Also, we know there are folks logging in through the webinar that have chats. So occasionally, I'll turn over to Jill Gentis. She's our Assistant Director of Communications to give me a question that came from online. So basically, for the next you know, 45 minutes, we're going to be able to field questions from you here in person, but also online. So we'll start, we'll start there. Good. Going to Tom Jackson here first. Um, the scale, well, we set up the scale with 2011 as a 10, and of course it got, there's an unlimited scale potentially, but we didn't expect anything would ever exceed 2011, and then we had 2015. So that's why you see a higher number there. Uh, the the, the 7.5 would put it a little below the 2017 bloom, so somewhere between that and 2013 would be the comparison between those two blooms. And I should say each one of these is very different in how they behave. Um, 2017, there was a very hot calm period in September, the last two weeks in September, which very much changed how that bloom looked prior to then. But 2013 is, an, is another model. So um, very important um, if we have north-northeast winds, mild north-northeast winds that ends out on Ohio um, and over to Michigan. And if we have south-southwest winds, which is what I think everyone in this room would like, but not the people from Canada on the webinar, then it ends out in Ontario. Um, it's a good example in that 2011 and 2015, the two worst blooms, 2011, we had a strong north-north, we had north-northwest winds, which sent it all the way across to past Toledo. In 2015, there was this mild southerly, and it was a lot more on the Canada side and in the Central Lake. So anyway, between 2013 and 2017 was about the scale, but it, I can't tell you now where it will end out. We do not have the ability to say, is it going to be thick here, or is it going to be up in, in Leamington in Ontario, or we can't, with that part, we can't answer. Pardon, what about them? 10, 10 and 10.5. 10, 10 for 2011, 10.5 for 2015. The scale was set on 2011. That's the the reference. So, yeah, we we, we yeah we figured that was the worst. So we got the back of the room, Tom Henry first, and then we'll come back to you. If you could introduce yourself as you, and then Rick or Laura will try and repeat the question so the folks in the webinar can hear it. Uh, Sean Haggerty from Channel 13. One of my viewers wants to know: Do any of these slides show the amount of discharge that water treatment plants dump during large rain events? and how that could factor in. Um, so, yes and no, right? Um, oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, so the question was if any of the slides show the amount of discharge from, um, I think it's from combined sewer overflows, right, um, that come in. And the, you know, where we monitor up in Waterville, we are upstream of what would come in from something like Toledo, but we would be capturing anything that would be coming in from like uh, Fort Wayne or something of that sort. Um, however, if you look at any of the most recent reports, uh, specifically Ohio EPA has taken estimates that have not only the permitted discharges that includes the combined sewer overflows, as well as septic tanks, and for the Maumee River, um, you know, I think it accounts for, if I remember correctly, somewhere around 13% of all of the phosphorus that comes out of the watershed, which means the vast majority of it is actually coming from what we call non-point sources, which is essentially land runoff. And there's, you know, and then from there we say, well, the land that's in the Maumee is, you know, 72% agricultural. So that's why we, we point to some changes that need to be happening at the agriculture. So, so for the number for the Maumee, when we look at 
all the wastewater treatment plants in the Maumee, it's about 9% of the total phosphorus coming in from the Maumee. And then also I want to make sure when we think about these releases from these combined sewer overflow releases where we have not been able to treat these water, they're because of heavy rain events. So the reason is, is these treatment plants can't hold that water. And so also when you're releasing it, it's releasing it at a dilute form. So because you release it, it's also in a dilute form, right? And so we know those numbers because they're point sources that are reported to the EPA, 9% for the mommy, and then again, usually it's, it's a diluted source of phosphorus. And again, we care about load for Lake Erie, but in the real time, the algae care about the concentration in the water. I'll, I'll add just one point. There, um, if there are, say, thunderstorms in July, August in the other part of the lake. Sometimes with those, you get very small, short-lived blooms near shore, um, like east of Cleveland. They're disconnected from this, so they're from a local source. Often, it's all rainfall mediated, and it's frequently just from the runoff. And it shows up near shore, lasts for a, day, a couple of days, and then typically goes away. And you also see there's a lot of effort happening in this space. Cleveland alone, I'm going to say $3 billion, but that number's not going to be exact, to build underwater pipes to store this runoff. So when you have these heavy rain events, rather than discharges through the CSO, it's moved into these underground pipes. When the water slows down and the, and the plants can catch back up again, they pump from these underground pumps and run it through. Um, so I think like 40 of the 62 CSOs within part of the Maumee have been identified, and there are plans in place to start addressing some of these CSOs. Tom Henry, I'm sure the first of, what, six, seven, eight questions, Tom, today? At least. At yeah. least. Go okay. ahead. So um, I was thinking the same thing about if the farmers can't get in the field because it's too wet, is that going to mean there's going to be less fertilizer, which you know appears to have happened? And le legacy phosphorus is what you're measuring now to some degree, um, you know, uh, and as well as you know the problems last fall and, and this spring. But I've had a lot of people coming to me and asking, what about the lagoons? If you're getting this much water, are there is you know, is there evidence of lagoons spilling over that are you know mismanaged? Which you know what Laura was modeling there is correct in theory that, you know, if you don't have as much applied, but there's always a wild card of what's not done legally or properly. Does your modeling here, I would think you would find something if there's evidence of any lagoon spilling over. It doesn't suggest that you have, but I'm just wondering to what degree in coming up with an estimate, you look at things like that of what is not necessarily, you know, the obvious. Yeah, so, um, so wait, I should repeat the question. Okay, because <laughs> that would take a long time. Anyway, okay, so, uh, so the first thing to point out is that, you know, we're just showing the actual monitoring data. It's like I measure a phosphorus concentration in the river, and those loads are that phosphorus that we measured in the river. So there's no estimates based off of anything. It's just, it is what it is, right? However, um, I do look very closely at the raw data. And I have, um, in working in other tributaries outside of Western Lake Erie Basin, seen instances of something like a lagoon spill or some sort of other spill. And usually not lagoon, but a, you know some sort of manure spill. And that's usually very, very obvious because the concentrations get very high very quickly and then they come down very quickly. And it's not always associated with the rain event lagoon you would think it would be. And we don't see any indication of that. But, you know, if it was just one and it was like, let's say it was up in the Blanchard and super far away from where we're monitoring Waterville, there's no way I would ever be able to detect that from a, what we're measuring because it would have been so dispersed and diluted by the time we got down to Waterville. So the only way we would have seen it in the Maumee data is if, you know, a, every lagoon that was possible there, and I still don't even know if that would happen, if they all overflowed at once, possibly. So does that answer your question? But I haven't heard, I haven't heard any reports of that happening. Um, uh, not that I would, but... So, so we'll come come back to that when we do have tech. Can I let me just just make one observation that um, if that did happen, which we don't know, um, if we, that were controlled, then the the reduction would be even greater this year than what we saw. So I'll come back to you, Tom. We got some other some one that came online that I know we have folks in the audience. So 
it's can we confirm with the nutrient industry to see how much P was applied in the fall compared to previous years? And I know we've got Jordan and Yvonne in the room. Last I saw come out of OSU, it was like 68% of the corn got into the field and like 46% of the soybeans. So we know the crop placement was low. Can you give us an indication on, on what you're hearing from farmers or nutrient service providers on the amount of nutrients applied, even fall and this spring, if you have an idea? Uh, fall was pretty low. Uh, it, it's the highest amount of rain that we've had in, in many, many years. So fall was also the same. Uh, crops came off very late, so it was low. Um, I would say if there's anybody present, Greg Labarge is the one who's done the research in terms of what they believe has happened uh, from, from OSU collecting its data. They believe that probably less than 15% of normal manure is what went on the fields. Um, and then Ohio Agribusiness is the one who's collecting the data in terms of commercial fertilizer, and they believe that it's probably less than 50% of what had gone on the fields. Ah, yes, and 1.3 million acres is what has gone unplanted in the Western Lake Erie Basin. Great, thank you very much. I got a question in the back corner. Tom, I haven't forgotten about you. You're, this will be two of six. Just hang on there, bud. Yeah, my question is, uh, normally around this time of year, the lake starts decreasing in terms of water levels. Assuming that it stays with, you know, on a normal, even at record high levels, how does that factor in the level of the lake with the uh, severity forecast? Well, every other year the lake level goes down. Um, it's it's sort of built into our models right now, implicitly but not explicitly. So, because every year the lake starts dropping at this time of year. Uh, so I wouldn't, I don't think we'd see anything that we could tell apart from variability in the system with that. So in the back of the room, Kelly Fry. Uh, my question is for Laura. Um, this is my own general observation along with talking to some of my farmer friends, but I have noticed that uh, in the last week, two weeks, things are changing in the field. Farmers are getting in the field even though we've maybe missed the, some of the insurance uh, requirements as far as being able to collect insurance, farmers are still planning. Yep. And the, the number of uh, percentage is going up quite a bit. Yep. So at this late date, if they're not planting corn, they're planting soybeans, how much of an effect would that have on your forecast if they're able to get a, a large percentage of the farms planted? So, so yeah, so the question being if, um, you know, if planting is still happening, what is that basically doing to phosphorus levels in the, in the river, which would then affect the forecast? And so, to, from my standpoint, I, well, the first thing we have to note is we're always like about a week to two weeks behind in our, in our water quality data. So I have not seen what has happened in this past week. Um, I've projected what's happening in this past week, but I haven't seen it because, you know, that data is being analyzed right now. <laughs> and so that's what happens. Um, and that's how we have to deal with that. Um, I would think, you know, if you know, the vast majority of phosphorus that gets applied is usually, a, a biggest chunk of it is usually in the fall as a broadcast. If it's coming on with planting, then it's being banded with the seed and it's being put into the soil. If we don't have any runoff events from here on out, it shouldn't really have any effect, right? Because we need to have rain in order to take the phosphorus and move it somewhere else. Um, and that's really the only effect that I would imagine seeing. The one thing I will note is, you know, with corn, they usually side dress for nitrogen, um, you know, a, a few weeks after planting. And so I'm keeping an eye out. We usually see that very clearly in the water. We get this big nitrate spike. Um, so I'm looking for that to be an indicator of how much corn actually was planted. Haven't seen it yet, but again, like I said, we're a couple, we're a couple weeks behind on that data. And so uh, once I have that, uh, you know, I think we'll have a better indication of what's happening on the ground, too. All right, so Tom, and then Karen, and then in the back. So, Tom. Uh, Rick, I was going to ask you, uh, regarding the Detroit River and the dilution effect of that, although it's true that, you know, you know it's not as much of a nutrient problem in general, there is, uh, you know, the Thames River going into Lake St. Clair, which comes down, and there's been researchers like Jan Sabaro at the University of Windsor who genetically tracked it coming into 
Western Lake Erie, uh, and the Thames is the most agriculturally impacted uh, part of of uh, Ontario um, in Southwest Ontario. There, so are you are you guys expecting more of an impact possibly from the Thames River or some of those nutrients that you know come from outside Metro Detroit? Thames River is an interesting question. Uh, it's uh, at least on the higher level, the Thames, the rainfalls are somewhat regional. So the Thames will tend to follow the Maumee overall, which is good. So the Maumee does provide a tracer. Other, the other factor is the Thames is a source. I, we, don't, we consider possibility some of the uncertainty on the models between years could possibly be due to some of the nutrient input from the Thames. Um, from this point on, the Thames is pretty negligible. Uh, I, the Thames flow, we can see very clearly in, in, in the higher resolution satellite in, imagery we're using, and we don't see that. And I should add, we don't see cyanosporm in the Detroit River plume in any part of it. So the Thames is pretty much a spring phenomena, and after that, there's not enough flow out of the Thames River at this time of year to push water down in, into the area. Like we, there's, Lake St. Clair will have a cyanobacteria bloom on the south shore, and we don't see that actually showing up in Lake Erie. A few cells show up in that bloom. Tom, did you want to add to that? Are you? Let me come back here to have Tom do it before we ask the new question, and then we'll flow forward. Hi, uh, Tom Bridgman from the uh, University of Toledo Lake Erie Center. Just to comment on Tom Henry's question, uh, the Offshore waters towards the Detroit River of the Western Basin right now are extremely low in phosphorus. It's basically Lake Huron water out there in, uh, in towards the uh, mouth of the Detroit River. So if there's a Thames effect that's not showing up out in the open water to the lake. On the other hand, the Ohio shoreline and the waters towards in the Ohio waters are extremely high in nutrients right now. So uh, I guess I would expect that um, if the waters don't mix, we will probably have uh, clear water in the upper half of the Western Basin and a big bloom in the bottom half of the Western Basin. So I think we should hope for strong winds that mix that water up and dilute the bloom or dilute the nutrients somewhat. Thanks, Tom. So we have another question here in the back. Hi, <clears throat> David Ruck. Um, we seem to be really good at predicting and modeling what the phosphorus is going to be and predicting the size of the bloom. Where are we at with modeling uh, indicators that might tell us how toxic the bloom might be? And what, what is that, and should we be doing that? Uh, is Justin in the room? He yep, be so the best Kristen Fussell is going to take it. So this is just Dr. Justin Chaffin. He's the research coordinator here at Sea Grant and Stone Lab. Yeah, so we are currently in uh, the second year of a three-year project looking into developing a toxicity forecast. Uh, in general, we know that we know that nitrogen is extremely important for bloom toxicity. Uh, the microcystin toxin uh, the cyanobacteria makes about 14% nitrogen, um, and when we see when we see nitrogen levels decrease in the lake, uh, we see the bloom toxicity decrease with it. Um, so in general, we see uh, the most toxin per cell uh, in the early part of this early part of the bloom, and then it. And then it progresses to a more non-toxic bloom later in, in, the, in, in the fall. And I'll make mention, so that's an ECOHAB funded project, multiple universities involved, but we had some questions around from the elected officials talking about the funding for that, and that comes underneath, and I'm looking for Tim Davis, under Habarka, so the harmful algal bloom, hypoxia, and so that funding that's coming from the federal level is funding ECOHAB and MERHAB and other projects like that. So there is critical con co funding coming in from the federal level for that. That, by the way, is in, out of NCOS, where um, our, the program's a sister office to mine that Margot manages. Perfect. Karen Schaefer. Um, every year that we have one of these forecasts, we learn something from your data from Heidelberg University, from your forecasts from the previous year, Rick, Tom, that we didn't know before. This year, it's what happened with ag. And we've got an awful lot of new pieces that are coming along, from toxicity to modeling and, and uh, 
pictures of, of water intakes. But we also have increasing rainfall. We also have farmers who aren't getting out into the fields and who may go broke. How much closer are we getting? I mean, what is your sense of confidence about how much closer we're getting to really nailing down what we need to do and tweaking it quickly in such a way so that at the beginning of a season, we go, oops, this is happening. Let's start doing this now. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty complicated question. And so what I would say is that we, we do have a lot of research going on from the Kevin Kings and the Greg Labarges and, and, and those working in the manure space on how to fine tune our best management practices. Unfortunately, the reality for this is that one BMP, one best management practice, doesn't have the same fit for every field. And so even though we know the efficacy of one on one spot, it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to have the same efficacy on another spot. Um, and these things that we're learning are important things to learn. It's telling us things about the tri-state fertilizer recommendation. So we know we need to have a maintenance level, but do we need to think about how broad that maintenance level, level is? You know, so when we say let's put that bank in there so that in those years that, you know, the, the agricultural producers were throwing a curveball this year with a wet fall and a wet spring, we need to make sure that we have enough bank of phosphorus in there to help those farmers, but how much bank is too much bank or how much bank is too, too little bank. So there's still a lot of a lot of work that needs to go here. I mean, when you look at the three counties that Laura put up on the figure of, if you don't put any, apply, apply any fertilizer, how quickly does the soil phosphorus drop versus one time versus two time? None of those are the same. And so we've got to remember as we move forward in here, we're dealing with roughly seven, Gail, I'm looking at you, 7.2 million acres in the western basin of Lake Erie. Or is that the Maumee alone? I can't, you know, 4.5 and I think it's seven and change for the entire western basin. There's a lot of acres, and if we're thinking there's a silver bullet out there um, that works, it's not the reality. And then you add the fact that that BMP might work under one condition. If you get a rainy year or a dry year or a warm year or a cold year, these things are variable. This is the complex world that we live in here. And so I, I don't think, and you know, I'm not confident to stay up here and say that we're two years away from knowing which levers to pull under which conditions or 10 or 15, but I can tell you that we're directionally correct. And that by engaging the researchers and the producers and the agencies, you know, the, the recommendations that are coming out of here, are, are, out of this work, are solid in the right direction. And, and just to add to that, you know, with the way that BMPs have to be implemented on the farm, um, you know, and the types of changes that we're talking about, they're long term. You know, it's going to, we have to have patience for some of these big changes to happen. I don't foresee us being at a point where we can treat the diffuse type of runoff that we get from a non-point source, like it was a, a contaminant, you know, spill, which is, you know, what, you know, that sort of like, oh, no, this happened, let's react to it. Like, you know, if you're going to try and make it so that you have less runoff, you're going to have to have done practices over um, longer periods of time than just in that moment. So I, I don't know that that type of approach is really going to be effective, unless we do something crazy. <laughs> Thank you. Kathy Kowalski, uh, journalist. Um, my question actually follows up on Karen's in two respects. One, you've talked about targets when you were shown all your graphs. So, and I think, Chris, you'd mentioned before, we've got this whole mix of stuff that we're doing. Um, how fine-tuned do we have to do to try to get best management practices? Does it have to be? site specific by field by field by field by field or can we just say looks like it looks you know in this category like how specific do we have to get to fine tune that solution and then also when you talk about target I remember Noel Aloysius had a study a few years ago that suggested eh, maybe that 40% reduction is really a moving target with climate change so I guess both of those factors, what do we have to do to try to use this information then to get the solutions? Well, so to come to the last part of that, the 40% reduction is a moving target. We have seen that that number holds true, right? So if you had 2011 second worst bloom on record, 2012 was a drought, you got to the 40% reduction because you didn't have a mechanism to carry, the bloom was where we would like to see it. That's the target we're calling. 
Then you have 2015, which is the worst bloom on record, and 2016 is a drought, you get to the 40% and no bloom. Now, when I talk about this issue, and, and, and I try and do this um, everywhere I go, is I talk about this issue in what I call three buckets. So we need to think about nutrient application in the here and now, and things like the four R's, right rate, right time, right place, right source. But they're also going to have a contribution of the legacies. And I, unfortunately, I don't like that word legacy, but it's out there and it's there. But you're going to have a bank of phosphorus that's in there from four decades ago, from farmers doing what we told them to do, that you can bank phosphorus and it stays in your soils. And then you're going to have the water management issue. And so as we see global climate change, I don't think it's the 40% number that's got to change. It just means we're working in a context that makes it more difficult to get to that 40% because you have this mechanism to drive the water from the landscape. With that answer, I'm going to actually put Gail on the spot because you were one of the early players in Annex 4 and talking about how that's a, you know, an adaptive management number and that sort of thing. Do you want to make any other additional comments on that, Gail? Only to say that the target is based on nine years out of ten because we always know that there will be years when the rainfall is so great, such as what we're seeing this year. I think the other point is, and part of your question was about how detailed do we need to get, and certainly we do need to apply the diagnostic tools to individual farm operations. And that means nutrient planning and understanding what the soil test levels are, not just for a field, but areas within a field, so that we can target and be more prescriptive to, as to which practices are going to work best where. And I think that's the point that, that Chris was alluding to. And then certainly, but the one practice that's rising to the top, as, as Laura indicated, is placement, getting that fertilizer in contact with the soil. The issue is that we just need to get that practice at, a, at enough of a scale to make a water quality difference, and we're just not there yet. And I, I would say when it comes to specialized field-by-field -field type um, recommendations that, um, you know, although it would be nice to have one big thing across the whole watershed that's going to just fix it all, it, with the level of detail and, and the detailed differences from one farm operations to the next, um, the slight differences in what they're dealing with in general, um, there has been some evidence from field scale models that taking a field scale approach, even if it's not the exact same BMP anywhere, um, can still get us to some pretty substantial reductions. So, you know, if that's the way that we need to do because that's how the community responds to making improvements on their field, then I think field to field is just fine. So, yeah, uh, my name's Aaron Wilson. I'm an atmospheric scientist with OSU. I uh, work with the State Climate Office and also with OSU Extension, working with farmers on uh, the impact of changes to our climate and, and basically becoming resilient to these things. And I wanted to comment on this string because we're talking about action, and, and one of the areas is actions with farmers. And farmers are aware of what's taking place, right? Uh, they're being pressured by this. So for instance, if you look at Northwest Ohio, this was the wettest March to June. Uh, three of the top five have occurred since 2010, right? And five of the top 10 have occurred since 2010. So when we think about the variability, yes, there's uncertainty year to year, but what we know clearly from the trends is off-season precipitation is increasing, right? Our spring precip, our fall precip, and, and that we, that, that's part of the message in terms of, of what actionable items do we take to help this problem. Sure, there's year to year variability, but we can rely on those trends that are really clear. The evidence is really clear that these trends are occurring. Just to follow up on that, when we say spring and fall, that's when your farmers need to be in the field. So when we're talking about these rain events, it's that fall application and then the spring. And so, you know, these are the things where the science can tell us, you know, here's the solution. But in, in practice, it's very difficult. We're going to go to the back of the room, and then, Tom, I'll come back to you. So please. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Helen. I'm an intern at Limnotech this summer. Um, I'm actually I just recently got listed as a contributor to um, our EcoHab project. Is the main scope of the EgoHab project, like these are the factors we know, so let's focus on how this affects toxic, toxicity, location, et cetera, et cetera, or should, we, or should we be kind of like widening our lens in terms of like, oh, this could be a contributor or a factor to location toxicity, et cetera, et cetera. So Kristen, can you get the mic to Justin on that question? Repeat that. There was a lot of stuff to take in real quick. <laughs> you 
Mm-hmm. Which which we're on. Yeah. Right. So I, I think way I'm way I'm going to interpret your question is um, on the applied side. So I'm under the impression is if we stop the harmful algal blooms in the lake, you know, if we reduce phosphorus, and if we target some, if we if we try to minimize phosphorus by 40%, we're also going to minimize nitrogen by some sort of percent. Might not be 40, might be more or less. Um, but if we minim if we stop the bloom from occurring, then we'll stop the balloons from producing toxins. And so, Justin, you're not using just existing data sets, too. You do have experimental trials and different uh, in-lab and in-lake measurements that are still happening. So there is some stuff that are still unknowns that new experiments that haven't been run before will be run. But come into Tom Jackson, please. Yeah, uh, Dr. Stump, as you mentioned in your presentation, the forecast last year was off a little bit. Um, the bloom was, was more mild than you had predicted. Could you tell me how confident you are with this year's forecast? And can you explain in terms that a, a layman or a newspaper reporter would understand how you tweaked your models to in, in the light of what you learned last year? The, um, I'm pretty. I'm confident that this is what that the forecast this year is is better um, than last year. On the the and the the one interesting wrinkle, which actually Tom Bridgman kind of hit, is what's the impact of the high flood of Detroit River? And right now, that's not mixing into the rest of the basin. In which case, that will have very little impact. On reducing the bloom beyond what we'd expect. As far as the models, uh, it, at least one of the models has been uh, replaced by another model. Um, um, we actually excluded one of the models this year that we used last year, and um, because of the conditions this year, we felt it would do um, uh, it would produce a problem. And then how we weighted them. So we made a series of changes um, to reflect both. What, what happened last year and the conditions we're seeing this year. Try to make sure we're using the models that uh, best represent what's going on and, and produce the best results. So if you guys haven't met him before, Tom Henry. No respect, man. <laughs> so obviously, you know, 2012 we had a drought. You don't have much, you know, much of a bloom. And uh, is the lesson from this without being too flip, that if you're not going to have a drought and you're looking to have a year with little or no algae, I mean, 7.5 is still pretty much up there. But as you said, it was mitigated. There's not as much fertilizer out there because there was too much rain to get farmers out in the field. And those that did now, there's a dilution factor. So again, not to be too flippant, but is the most ideal situation either a drought or a total shitload of rain for a seasonal uh, thing, or is the worst is the worst condition for the lake going to be somewhere in between where farmers are able to get out in the field and you get you know reasonably heavy, maybe not record-setting rain? Uh, the, everyone probably heard that. Uh, no. <laughs> the um, the, the conditions, we, we tended to go from drought to wet to dry. Um, and if we, if we hit about an average, we got to the average and stayed average or below, which is not drought, drought is obviously very below, but if we're average or below, um, with the, the target we had, we will, be, we will see fairly small blooms. So we, we only need to get to average uh, rain. We've been in, we've been in a cycle. Re I don't know if a cycle is the right word, but sort of a cycle. So we've had a point where we've had several wet springs, one after another. And and what does that tell me about climate change? You're asking an oceanographer. <laughs> <laughs> 
to explain climate change models. Um, uh, the best I can say is is the um, you, swings are, are considered by the climate scientists as being more common. So this could be an indication of an impact of climate change. Uh, I, although I would say, although you're a reporter typing right now, don't quote me on that for a while. <laughs> Because that really, we'd really have to look at the climate models for this area and see how, how the reaction would be. I don't know if our atmospheric scientists could answer that question. Um, or, yeah, can because, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, that would be a better way to go with that one. So I can say if we can, if we can hit average or below on the core question, the, we will be in great shape. And in fact, if we're a bit a little above average, with the target, we will still end out with a mild bloom. The target is such that we can be a bit, because 2008 was not an average, it was a bit above it, not severely above average, but it was a little bit above the average um, discharge. So we would be better off if we're in that range. We don't have to go to drought conditions to get rid of the bloom. Well, just, but uh, can I add? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just, well, I was just going to say in, in brief here. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody's wondering now we've had so much rain, yet, you know, we're starting to see dry, dry conditions develop very rapidly around the state. So you can get those strong switches from off season to mid summer, you know, in the growing season. As far as a climate projection of those changes, yeah, there's some indications from the climate models that even though precipitation goes up annually and in individual events, that our summers may actually get drier, right? So that you have seasonal water shortages or short term droughts during the summer with very intense fall and, and spring precipitation. So that is definitely something that the models are indicating even to the mid-21st century. Okay, so the, the thing I, I wanted to address was, um, you know, in order to have a lower bloom, you know, do we, can we not do anything except for have a very dry year or a super wet year, right? And I would say what we have learned from this year on the backs of a lot of suffering farmers is that, um, is that we could probably nuance the way we deal with nutrient management to get to these targets. It gives us a glimmer of hope that, you know, that we can farm and apply nutrients um, in a way that we can still get something like a 30% reduction, right? Um, and, and the reason I say that is because I showed you what soil test levels would be expected to be from one year to the next. We don't really expect them to change that much. And so it has points to other things and the only other thing that makes sense, like I said, to me is a placement issue. And if it's a placement issue, then that means we can fix this. We just have to get the right technology out to farmers to be able to do it. And that's, I would say, if anything, that's really good news. And that means exactly opposite of what you said, that in fact, we have a pathway forward for making it so that we can get to some of these reductions even in higher flow years or moderate years. I'm going to read a question that we've gotten from online. Actually, Laura, this one's directed to you. So if the air bars overlap on the loading time charts, are the padding, patterns meaning, meaningful statistically? Okay, so, yeah, so this is a very specific question. Um, and basically the question is, is are the trends that we see um, statistically significant, right, and the loading patterns and the flow rate mean patterns? And what I would say is that the way that I showed it to you was for visual representation and not for statistical representation. Um, but if you use more savvy trend analysis, that indeed they are significant changes. So also a question says, is there a history of higher nutrient levels in waterways coming from CAFOs? And if so, what is the difference compared to a corn farmer? And so the question here is that when we monitor it, the regularity that Heidelberg does, when you have that point in the river, what's happening upstream of that river could be a mix of manure and commercial fertilizer. So you're not monitoring right at the edge of a field that has just manure application. So we don't have that level of detail in this pool of work that was done ODHE. There is a project that is still in the background running that's looking at um, phosphorus fingerprinting and being able to look at the molecular weight of the phosphorus in the water. They're measuring to tie it back to a wastewater treatment plant, uh, background runoff, um, poultry, manure. Um, and so there is um, a methodology still being developed in the background that has not come out yet. I would say that when we look across our different watersheds and there's only slight variability across them, the main driver of differences is typically uh, percent agriculture and soil type. 
Uh, we don't see a very close relationship with the amount of, of animals in the basin, um, uh, unless you know we do know that extreme applications over a history of time, like Grand Lake St. Mary's, leads us to very high losses. We just don't see that in Western Lake Erie Basin. Representative Hoops. Laura, do you feel that there are enough monitoring systems out there, or do you plan to put more out there to in the Western Basin so we really get a more specific area, or do you feel there's enough systems Specifically out there? for streams and, and rivers? Um, I think it seems like we have the major river watersheds fairly well covered. You know, the priority watersheds that were uh, um, identified in Annex 4. Um, right now, I think. If we want, I think we, I think we're good. If we wanted to add anything, I would say it should be small watersheds. But it shouldn't just be haphazardly selecting small watersheds and adding monitoring to them. It should be with an experimental approach. And the idea being that if we're going to add a small watershed, that we understand very well. There's money to understand both what's happening in that watershed and then make some sort of a change in that watershed. So then we can use them. Um, as a way to understand how different practices, you know, basically use them as a way of seeing the future, how different practices might have an effect on nutrient runoff, and then be able to take that and then spread it across the whole watershed. So, you know, I think that being smart about where we put in additional monitoring is the way to go. Now, I'll mention we do have a number of small watersheds between us and USGS, um, and it seems like with H2 Ohio funding, we might be able to get to that point. Um, and maybe other funding gets to that point where we can actually start to do that in more detail than what we have been doing. So, and which is great because I have a few years of baseline data. Let's change something in these watersheds. It'd be awesome. You know, we talked about the about the legacy phosphorus yeah. because a lot of the farmers did not get out. And now they have fields that there's nothing in the fields. Is that going to be an issue because it's just going to be sitting there, and then when the rain comes? And there's no no crops on the plant. I mean, should we be looking at cover crops for those fields, or what what should we be looking at for these fields where there's nothing planted? I think that we should be looking at cover crops for those fields for a couple of reasons. I'm not going to say necessarily so you save phosphorus on the field. I mean, you might lose a little bit, but phosphorus is pretty sticky. I think it would save other things like keep your nitrogen up. Having fields that don't have anything on them through this hot summer sun is terrible for your soil. So having your field covered so that it doesn't dry out and crack and fissure as much is going to be really important. And then the third thing is that I know that the other main issue in Ohio right now is that there's probably going to be a big lack of forage crops, right? Not enough hay or other forage for livestock. And so if we can take advantage of this situation to do maybe a cover crop that can act like a forage that can be harvested for that purpose, maybe even earlier, um, I would say that's, that's taking advantage of a terrible situation. So, so there is a, a number, a small number of smaller streams now that the Ohio EPA has identified um, where they're putting in extra monitoring, in situ monitoring for nutrients and algae and toxins and things. Um, the mo one I'm most familiar with, Platter Creek in the upper Maumee near the town of Sherwood, they saw some, we I'll say weirdness in, in stuff that was downstream from there. So that gives them impetus then to then put it in this very small um, watershed. And I think Laura's right that that use right that can then we can test hypotheses and look at the small level. Uh, we can't do that with every small watershed. So it has to be on a, a place by place basis. There's been a lot of coverage about the you know high levels of water in the lake, and I know we've talked about that from, that from the point from the flow. From in terms of temperature, does most of the growth of the bloom occur at the surface, where the temperature is going to be similar regardless of the volume, or does it occur down in the water? Where I guess the question I guess is, with the increased volume, would there be any tangible change in, t in water temperature that could help you know prevent some of the growth? Uh, whenever the wind blows, the western basin is shallow enough that it mixes pretty thoroughly. So the temperatures, top to bottom, tend to be mixed. When the wind dies down, you, you start getting a thermal stratification. So there's there's just enough wind events that I would say the western basin, you're not going to see much in effect. Much different than the central basin. And Justin probably has a comment, extra comment on this. You might have have some data for this year. Yeah, I just want to make a point about, about the stratification. 
so the western basin right now is stratified about, around about 24 feet down. So it, in the deeper parts of the western basin it is stratified and we're um, even after the storms that came through earlier this week, we were, we were out the day after and we were measuring low oxygen near the bottom. Um, it, was, it was about one and a half, about one and a half milligrams per liter of oxygen. So we're getting pretty low oxygen right now. So let's hope for a big storm to mix it. So one of the things that, thanks for that, Justin. When phosphorus is found in the sediments, when those sediments go anoxic, that phosphorus can be released from the iron um, and the aluminum that are holding on to it. If we lose oxygen at the bottom of the lake, it is a potential source of phosphorus into the water column that's already in the lake. I'm looking at Tom Bridgman, the expert in that field, as he's nodding his head. So it's important to track these dead zones, especially in the western basin, um, for an, a new release of phosphorus. Um, we've got a question here from Representative Sheehy, and then I'm going to have some closing remarks. I uh, just uh, uh, expand on uh, uh, the comment a little bit earlier. Uh, a, a number of uh, farmers, of course, uh, are collecting insurance uh, because they, you know, they couldn't get in the field, put the crop in there, and part of the agreement with the insurance policy is that they're not allowed to then plant anything for that, uh, you know, for that growing period. But uh, already uh, we're working on that. Uh, my office and a number of offices around the Midwest uh, are uh, addressing that problem. Uh, I think at the congressional level, but. Just, just a final question. Uh, it, you know, I said as I watch, look at the, uh, the uh, four quadrants of the state, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the uh, the large family, uh, animal operations are and have been established over the last several years in the northwestern quadrant. And you know, and, and we always say, you know, some people say, well, look, the same number of animal uh, uh, units are there, but the big difference is they're concentrated. Uh, is is there some reason? Is there some reason other than drainage, why um, or a base, a, a possibly availability of feed, why those animal feeding operations are predominantly, overwhelmingly, in the northwestern quadrant? I have no idea. Devon Jordan. <laughs> I would guess it's related to the percent of agriculture, and there's slightly higher percent agriculture in northwest Ohio. So Jordan's saying we don't want your cows rolling downhill is the problem. No, so to be serious, but it is roads, water, feed, um, topography. There's a lot of factors that, that play into that into that role. Thank you for that, Jordan. And drainage, one of that. Not, okay. Well, yeah, to grow the crops, you would need drainage, but uh, to, to house them in facilities, it's it's a non-issue. So with that, we have about two or three minutes left. So um, I'm going to close down the webinar, and then I'll have some logistic announcements for those folks sitting in the room. Um, but I do want to just, uh, again, thank everybody for coming. Uh, this is a fantastic attendance, not only from our elected officials and our agencies, but to have the content experts, the scientists in the room. This is phenomenal. Uh, Margo, do you have any comments, closing remarks that you want to make? No? I did want to make mention as I'm sitting here, and one of them, the Herb Family Foundation is standing up and making their way to the lobster rolls, I'm sure. But I want to make sure, and we have the Lake Erie Foundation present here, so we have a lot of, of, of programs that exist here that are interested in the health of the Lake Erie and mobilizing funds for that. So I wanted to thank those two groups that I saw sitting in the audience while we were here. Um, and so with that, we will, we will close down um, the webinar. The questions that came in via the chat function, um, I will work hard with my staff at Ohio Sea Grant Snow Lab and the content experts around the room to get a, a narrative response to those as quick as we can and try and get those posted on our, on our website. Um, so if I can get a, a round of applause for, for sure. Um, you don't even know what you're clapping for yet. <laughs> but again, Rick travels a long way to come in to give uh, the forecast and for the support from NCOS to get Rick out here. And Laura Johnson and the and National Center for Water Quality Research, Rick alluded to it, without that center, without ex that exhaustive sampling in multiple locations in partnership with the USGS, this wouldn't be possible. So thank you for that. And with that, we'll shut down the webinar. And those of you sitting in the room, if you can just be patient for one second. <laughs>